information to cover and um, want to start promptly so that we can get to the important items that uh, we want to leave you with tonight. My name is Russell Chisholm. I am the co-chair of Protect Our Water Heritage Rights and the coordinator of the Mountain Valley Watch Construction Monitoring Program. I'm joined tonight by Wild Virginia Executive Director Misty Bowes, Grace Tuttle, Powers Coordinator, Jessica Sims, Virginia Field Coordinator for Appalachian Voices, Autumn Crow from West Virginia Rivers, and Wild Virginia Conservation Director David Sly. Um, I want to give a special thanks also to Virginia Pipeline Resistors for their countless contributions to the MVP fight, including our FERC guide and talking points documents. And um, our pre presenters tonight need a little bit more introduction. Um, David has worked for 35 years to make the promises of our environmental laws real. He has consistently and successfully pushed government agencies like FERC, who we're gonna talk about tonight, and Virginia DEQ, to base their actions on science, law, and the public interest. Autumn Crow from West Virginia Rivers is a longtime monitor of Mount Valley Pipeline construction. Uh, staff scientists over there at West Virginia Rivers who grew up fishing and swimming in the uh, waters of the Greenbrier River. So no surprise, she uses her experience as an environmental scientist to promote wetland protections, conduct environmental site assessments, and demand stronger permitting analysis in West Virginia. And they're gonna throw a lot of information at you tonight. Before we get to those presentations, if we can go to the welcome slide. Just as a reminder, um, please use the chat, introduce yourself, tell us where you're logging in from tonight. Um, please keep your microphone muted throughout the presentation to make it easier for everyone to hear um, the detailed information that we have to put out tonight. Put your questions in the chat as well. And again, you can leave your camera off if you prefer not to be on camera throughout this. Our goals for tonight are to learn about this most recent amendment request from Mountain Valley Pipeline submitted to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. We're gonna learn how to use FERC's e-library, e-filing, um, and e-comment functions. And the main goal is to get you, when you leave here, ready to submit a comment on this amendment request by March 22nd. We'll ask you to share the talking points documents that we've prepared, uh, become an intervener, and we have resources for you to use to do that and also to join this growing coalition of people who have been resisting this project these many years, and especially at this point where we believe we can defeat it once and for all. I do wanna say um, for folks who maybe are unfamiliar, we'll be talking a lot about the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which is five commissioners appointed by the president with the advice and consent of the Senate they serve five-year terms, and they have an equal vote on regulatory matters. FERC, as we call them, is the agency that regulates interstate transmission of electricity, natural gas, and oil, including interstate fracked gas pipelines, like the Mountain Valley Pipeline. So that's a lot to, to process already. I'm going to turn it over to David to get going on the details of tonight's presentation. All right, um, and I'll, I'll start by just reiterating that there's a lot here. I know I see some people out there who are already FERC veterans, uh, so it won't be as daunting to some of you, but I don't think that you need to catch all of this. We're, we're here on an ongoing basis to help with this stuff. Uh, there's so many twists and turns that it, it, your head will probably spin a little bit if you're new to this. Uh, but just, just realize there's a lot of help available. We're not just doing this, but we're here to, to, to back folks up going forward too. Um, so I just wanted to make clear there are, and this is another source of confusion that I get all the time. There are a whole bunch of things going on in relation to the pipeline. Just to be clear, what we're talking about tonight is a proposed amendment that MVP asked FERC to make to their requirement or to their certificate that would allow them to bore under 
uh, over 180 streams that previously they wanted to go through. Um, we can talk about the reasons for that, but essentially they're trying to they're trying to move as quickly as they can, and they thought that was a way that they could they could accomplish that. Um, but there are other things going on, and again, we 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 work hard to try to keep you up to date on all these pieces. Uh, but I wanted to make sure you understood that that's the only piece we're talking about tonight. Uh, there are other pieces, including one that's going to deal with the Corps of Engineers and the state of Virginia and the state of West Virginia, that's going to be really important. But just stay tuned for that. Uh, there will be comment chances uh, on these other parts, but we'll get there. Um, so again, this is a request that MVP made to change the approval that they first got from FERC to allow them to, to, to bore under all these water bodies. When FERC creates a new case, if you will, they call it a docket and they give it a new number. And so even if you've been involved in the past in MVP issues and FERC's information, you were probably on another docket. So it's important to know that there's a new one. And if you want to be involved, you have to, you have to interact with that. Um, now, we're going to address two kinds of impacts that pipelines have. One is the very specific kind of impacts that come from these, these boring operations. And then in a kind of a broader, broader sense, how the pipeline affects local, state, national, uh, you know, global environment and why it's important because all that can kind of be brought into the picture. And I'm gonna turn it over to Autumn Crow from West Virginia Rivers Coalition who has some really good detailed information about what these borings are about, how they would work and the kind of problems that they would cause. So Autumn. Thanks, David. Okay, so, um, so what we're talking about here is a, um, a proposal from MVP to amend their certificate to cross 181 water bodies. These are both streams and wetlands, um, but they're specifically looking at 120 locations. So there's 37 in West Virginia and 143 in Virginia. And so in, in some of these borings, they're going to be crossing um, multiple streams and wetlands at the same time. Um, the boring lengths, they will range anywhere from 30 feet if they're just dealing with like a small wetland or a, um, a small stream, all the way to 1,250 feet for the Greenbrier River. Um, so they're, they're varying greatly in length um, and then when they do these borings, they have to have a pit on either side of the water body. And some of these bore pits are going to be huge. Um, they vary from five to 45 feet deep. And um, for some of the longer borings, they could take anywhere up to four months to complete. So we're, you know, while it might seem that the borings would be um, less impactful on the water body since they're going under them and not through them, this is still a very extensive um, construction process that they're undertaking. Next slide. And so there's a, there's a couple different methods that you can use to bore under the water bodies and they'll, they'll select a, a different method depending on the length. The conventional bores um, are, are the easiest to undertake and they, they use like an auger to, um, to carve out a hole under the ground. So what they, they um, while the stream bed remains intact, um, they'll dig a bore pit on each side. And then um, for some of the longer crossings, they'll use either a guided conventional bore where they have like a drill bit that they can um, maneuver or a direct pipe where they have like a pilot um, they call it a pilot, and it basically pulls the pipe through the 
boring while it's drilling. Um, the, the conventional bores, they usually just um, use um, the auger, um, but the, um, the guided conventional bore and the direct pipe, they'll use drilling mud or slurry, um, bentonite clay mixed with water. So as I said, you know, the, the stream bed will remain intact, um, but some of the disadvantages of the borings are that they, for the um, guided conventional and the direct, Sorry, I was muted. Um, they, um, they'll actually have to use a lot of water and drilling mud for the direct pipe. Um, so there's a possibility when they're using this drilling um, slurry that there could be a bentonite blowout. And I'll show you some examples of that. Um, and then when they have these pits, you know, they're right next to the streams or they're in wetlands. So there's um, the groundwater is really high. The water table is really high. And so those pits will fill with water. And a lot of times they're dewatering devices. They, they have to pump that water out of the bore pit. And a lot of times they're, they'll have failures of the dewatering devices. And we'll go, I'll show you some pictures of that too. So next slide. Oh, back one. Sorry. So I was mentioning the, um, the conventional bore process. So these, these are the types of plans that they provide in their, um, in their proposal package. Um, this one's actually a bad example uh, because they don't even show a bore pit on the other side of the Greenbrier River. Um, so this is the type of, of stuff that we're dealing with here. When we're trying to review these plans, they're often um, you know, missing very important details and inaccurate. So, um, I, I kind of explained this all, already that the, um, the two pits are constructed and then the pipe is pulled under the stream bed um, through the bore pit and um, out the other side. Next slide. So I mentioned that the groundwater is going to be entering the bore pit and that's mixing with the disturbed soil producing sediment laden water. Um, and one of the things that um, we don't really know that they haven't really explained is how much water they're going to be dealing with. Um, the, the dewatering devices have to be sized appropriately depending on how much water they're pumping out of the bore pits. And so a lot of times their pumps get overwhelmed and the bore pits overflow into the stream the um, dewatering devices can get overwhelmed and overflow and that, um, you know, these are located right next to the stream. So all of that sediment laden water um, can enter the stream and um, cause increased turbidity, which harms aquatic life. And so the, the other problem is the, the drill slurry. Now they're only gonna be using that drilling mud uh, for a couple of the borings, but, um, what we've seen in other pipelines is that drilling slurry is mismanaged and spilled into water bodies or into wetlands. And that also has like the same effect as a lot of sediment because it's, it's basically clay. And so it, um, it can clog gills and fish, it harms aquatic life, it smothers habitat. Um, so while you know, they're leaving the stream bed intact, if they are sloppy in their construction practices, which we know MVP, has been, then you know they still have a potential to to harm the environment with these borings. The drilling mud is made out of um, bentonite clay and water. So, um, just to give you a, a couple examples of some water quality or quantity impacts, you have the disruption of the groundwater flows when you're pumping, you know, massive amounts of water out of these pits. Um, and putting it, you know, you're putting it into these dewatering devices. It's depending on the, um, the quantity of the groundwater, you know, areas could have disruptions in their residential wells. Um, if they're not um, handling the sediment laden water properly, you know, they, they could have 
um, cloudy water, muddy water in their wells. There's accidental spills of um, you know, the heavy equipment that's sitting right next to the stream. Um, they could be spilling um, petroleum or lubricants from the uh, heavy equipment, drilling mud. Um, I mentioned the failures of the watering devices. And then this is just compounded when you have multiple crossings within a watershed. All of the above impacts can be compounded. Next slide. So this is an example of a bent night blowout. Um, this is where they, when they're doing the, the guided bore, um, there is so much pressure and the bentonite actually, it, the stream bed can rupture and the bentonite clay can actually be released into the stream through a fracture of the stream bed if they're not going deep enough. Um, so that's just an example of when the, the bentonite um, gets into the, the stream through a fracture. They call it a, an inadvertent release or a frack out. Next slide. So, you know, there's a lot of impacts that they need to consider when, um, when reviewing this proposal. Um, and their, their proposal that they have submitted is severely lacking in information needed to determine, you know, the impacts. Um, so what we are asking is for FERC to draft a supplemental environmental impact statement that takes into consideration all of these impacts and additional analysis that's needed. So the amount of the dewatering that would be necessary from all of their bore pits, that hasn't been determined. They've said that there may need to be pumping 24 seven at the bore pits, but, and there's discussion of how much water the pumps can handle, but there's no discussion of whether they're dewatering, how much water their dewatering devices can hold. So these dewatering devices, they're basically um, hay bales stacked in square with some filter fabric down in it and maybe some fencing around it to hold it in place. And so they're talking about, you know, thousands of gallons that they're going to have to pump out, but there's no mention of how much capacity these water dewatering devices can hold. So a lot of times they'll just overflow if they're not, um, if they're not maintaining them properly. Um, mixed, mixed ground is, is basically when the, the, um, the soil is disturbed and it's, um, it's interfacing with water. And so it's, you know, you have disturbed soil, you have a lot of water and then you have sediment laden water. Um, so there's insufficient analysis on the dewatering impacts when you're sucking out all of this groundwater out of these bore pits, what effect is that going to have, um, on the groundwater? And there's no mention of that in their environmental report. Uh, there's no mention there. Well, there, they did in their final EIS, they analyzed, um, nearby residential drinking water wells. And by nearby, they mean within 150 feet. In my opinion, that's not sufficient. I mean, they need to expand their radius of um, nearby drinking water wells because the groundwater, you know, it, it can go a lot further than 150 feet, these impacts. So they, they have insufficient analysis on how many drinking water, private drinking water wells would be impacted, potentially impacted by groundwater impacts. And then there's no mention of how they're going to manage all of the drilling mud for the longer bores, such as the Greenbrier River. Um, they're gonna need um, 600,000 gallons of water to perform that long of a bore. It's uh, 1,250 feet. And they have not mentioned anywhere how they're going to manage all of that drilling mud and the water, the slurry mix. Um, Additionally, you know, when they're, they're doing these bores, um, you know, we're talking about, we're talking about stream beds. We're talking about bedrock. Um, it's very rocky. It's very cobbly. Um, so they basically say 
for a 42 inch pipeline, anything, any kind of boulders that they encounter that are greater than 14 inches can deflect the drill bit, meaning it, it sets it off course. Um, and they have only done feasibility assessments on six of the 120 borings. So when I talk about a feasibility assessment, they actually do geotechnical analysis. They actually look at the geology and they do test pits and look at the substrate to see what it's composed of. And if you're going to try to bore under a stream bed and it has a lot of cobbles and boulders, then you're, you're going to have a lot of deflection. Um, but they haven't done adequate geotechnical analysis to, to really know what they're going to encounter in all of these borings. So long story short, they need to do a lot more homework um, to make sure that this process can be done right. And you know, what we're, what we're seeing on the ground with Mountain Valley Pipeline is that they can't do it right. They're already impacting water quality and the environment um, with what they've done so far. So that's why it's really important that we all comment um, on these um, deficiencies in their proposal and make them, you know, do the job right. And I think, yeah, that's it for me. Okay, uh, thanks Autumn. And I just wanna uh, remind people that I think we're gonna make these slides available or a link to the slides and a recording of this presentation. So if you if you don't digest all of that, I mean, that's some great technical kind of information and analysis. And uh, anyway, it gives you a flavor of the kind of threat that this boring presents. One point that I think can never be made too much, and that is that if MVP and FERC thought this was a great idea from the beginning, uh, it's strange that it took them about six years to get here and decide now that it's the best way to do this. It is clear that they're only doing it because they're trying to evade requirements that the Corps of Engineers has. Um, but, you know, FERC has um, authority over this whole project. And although they want, in this case, just to look at these proposed borings, uh, they can't really do that. Um, they have to look at the thing in context of everything that has happened and everything that will happen from here out. Um, and, you know, some of these impacts that I've listed here, um, pollution of streams and wetlands and the damage that that can cause to uh, species, to human uses, uh, groundwater, and property damage, all those things uh, can and probably will occur during these drilling operations, but they certainly have been present uh, on a very widespread basis uh, throughout the project. And so, you know, the fact that those damages have been done uh, really just about everywhere you can look on the project, you've seen big problems. And despite the fact that they've been in construction for about three years, they're still having some of the same kind of problem. So we can't we can't assume, and FERC cannot assume that going forward, they have somehow all of a sudden reformed and figured out how to do everything correctly. Uh, the other thing is that some of the streams and wetlands that will be affected by these borings. Uh, especially if they don't do them correctly or if they haven't planned correctly. Some of those areas have already had serious impacts from what they call the upland activities. So you may have a stream that has been really badly affected in an area right next to the place where they're going to now do this operation and hit it again. Uh, so all those are kind of, kind of the context and Again, a lot of folks have seen these ugly pictures, but I don't think we can see them too often because this is what, this is what they've done so far. And all that water that, that Autumn is talking about, you know, those pits are gonna fill up and it's not gonna be all pure pristine water and they're gonna do something with it. We have seen on other pipelines uh, where they, those bore, pill, bore pits filled up 
and they thought nobody was looking, so they just went ahead and pumped it straight to the stream. Uh, but their technology has not worked. Um, they were supposed to have sized different control structures all along so that it would keep these kinds of impacts from happening, and they just have not done so. Um, and then they've, they've caused really, really gross problems. Uh, you see uh, some folks farm field and farmland here that sat in, in uh, water. It was flooded for six, eight months or more. And MVP didn't plan for that. They didn't adjust their plans to make sure they didn't cause those kinds of problems. And they haven't fixed these places. Um, the one on the right is one of the places where the damage has been so, so severe that it's just eaten away people's land. Uh, I know of instances where people have lost eight or 10 feet of their stream banks because of the destruction. And as Autumn said, uh, groundwater contamination is a, a real threat and it has already happened. Uh, we know that some of the environments that they want to cross that they want to do these borings in are sensitive and they're real threats to the groundwater. And, you know, groundwater in these areas, some of it has been in amazing shape for, for generations. People have used them forever. And all of a sudden it can, it can very quickly uh, really be ruined. And this is one that's really not going to be associated with the bore pits because it's on the side of the mountain and I apologize that it's pretty bad quality. But this is just another example of how they haven't planned correctly, how they haven't uh, adjusted to problems when they, when they occur. Uh, there have been dozens, I'm sure probably hundreds of places where the land itself has slipped and slid uh, off of the off of the uh, right of way, off of the pipeline site, um, down downhill. Sometimes it goes into streams and water bodies. In this case, you'll see that green uh, kind of figure there. That's one uh, slide that came off of the pipeline right away, and and then there's an, another smaller down below. But those orange dots or orange circles are people's houses. They were actually endangered by these problems. So, um, you know, again, it, FERC cannot act as if we're starting from ground zero here and there's a clean slate. Uh, we know the, the kinds of problems that have existed. Um, and then, of course, a pipeline like this, it, it's not just a problem for the folks in the neighborhood. Uh, the landowners, the people who use those specific waters, although it can be catastrophic for them, this goes way beyond that. And so people, this is why people uh, understand that this is, this is a much bigger picture. Uh, building these pipelines can only encourage more fracking and fracking for longer periods. It, it will result in greenhouse, uh, large amounts of greenhouse gases uh, at, at the front end, at the fracking end, and throughout the pipeline system, you can have methane leaks. And then finally, um, the thing has a lot of cost economically. And frankly, the ones who, who make out well are the people who invest in and who want to build these things. Uh, it's not you and I, it's not our communities. And so, you know, the, the, the effects just go a long ways. And in this particular case, um, thank goodness so far, they haven't done the kind of damage to the Jefferson National Forest that they intend to do, or the Appalachian Trail. They have caused lots of problems for a lot of sensitive species. And this could well cause a lot more of those. So, I just think it's always good to put this in the in the larger context of the threats. Um, and again, you know, pipelines explode. They're dangerous. So um, one of the one of the big lessons that I always want to give people during these sessions is that you don't have to be an expert like Autumn. 
You don't have to be an attorney. Um, your comments matter wherever you're coming from because you have things that are um, valid interest and concerns that you can pass along. Um, and you can be sure that all the decision makers and the FERC commissioners and everybody else who has a, a knowledge of these situations knows that this case has had huge involvement from the public and we want to keep that going. That is an, an impetus for people to make better decisions going forward and it's the way we will in the end defeat this, this pipeline. Uh, we've all got to be part of that. And when you give comments, um, again, based on your own knowledge, based on your understanding of the issues, um, those go in the record, in the official record for this case. And for can't just ignore important, important information. Um, maybe sometimes they would like to, but they just can't do it, especially because um, if they make the wrong decision, as all these agencies have repeatedly, uh, we can take them to court and all that information is valuable. If we don't get it into the record during periods like this, then it's not available to use during those, those legal challenges. Um, so how do you make comments if you don't consider yourself an expert on the technical or legal issues? Um, First of all, you, you are an expert on certain things. If you use or live next to or, or love some of these water bodies, you, you might be an expert on those. You might know as much about those as the regulators. Um, but you know how, is, how are the actions that are proposed here going to affect you and the things you care about? Don't, don't shy away from getting into those kinds of specifics and talking about the values that these places have for you. Um, you know, why, why is, you know, um, whatever creek or whatever uh, important to you? How do you use it? Uh, has it been important to your family, you know, for generations? Um, all those kinds of things, they matter. Um, and again, you can hark back to the to kind of problems that have happened already and say, hey, we've already been a victim to these kinds of damages. Uh, now you're threatening us with new ones. And um, so, you know, again, do not be hesitant, do not be uh, intimidated to think that your voice can't matter. Um, as I say, if you, if you have real intimate knowledge of any of these water bodies, if you swim there or fish there, or just love the, those places for, for their intrinsic values, that's a legally protected interest that you have. A lot of people don't understand that, but the Clean Water Act says these places are supposed to be protected for the kind of uses that we have a right to make of them. Um, and as I say, if, if your land borders one of, these, one of these streams or one of these wetlands, you have a right to be able to look out there and see a nice, beautiful stream uh, not impaired by MVP. Um, you know, if you water your cattle from the stream or the pond that might be, might be affected, you have a legally protectable interest. So, you know, again, don't let anybody tell you that those aren't important, that the things you value don't matter. Um, there are so many things that could be brought into your comments and, and we're gonna share other information, other resources with you that kind of kind of help you, you know, think through those things. Um, and you heard some from Autumn as far as the lack really of, of the kind of information that would be necessary to make any kind of sound judgment on this proposal. Um, frankly, we know that MVP hasn't done the kind of study that they would need to, to know what kind of underground effects they would have in all these areas. Um, you know, it, it would just take a lot of technical work 
And again, given the fact that they've decided this on the fly because they decided they needed to move quickly uh, is not an adequate basis for saying, let them go ahead and do it. Uh, the fact that they have not shown either the willingness or the capacity to meet the rules so far and to protect our resources so far um, says an awful lot. Um, and, you know, things like the, the economic justification, the greenhouse gas effects, all those things are things that FERC can pay attention to. So you're not, you're not limited to a very narrow window. Um, so again, we're, we're gonna hear a little more and gonna tell you a little more about how you can, can kind of see, see other information and other ideas. But I wanna talk about how you actually go about commenting. And there are two, two tracks for that in this process. Um, you can make comments, of course, you could send them through the mail if you thought the US Postal Service would get them there in a week. Uh, but you'd have more faith than I do right now. Uh, probably the best way, the easiest way to do that is through FERC's website. Um, and those comments, as I say, they matter. FERC has to pay attention to them. But there's another level of involvement called uh, being an intervener. And that is kind of a legal designation that you can gain. Again, don't be scared of it because thousands of people have done it. And, and we know how to help you do it. So if you want to do that, uh, it can be very useful. Um, what that means really is if you go that route, if you become an intervener, then you have several things. You have some, some responsibilities and some rights. Um, if by chance, um, at some point you want to go to court or we want to go to court about this process and you have intervened, then you have standing um, to go to court or to join in a lawsuit. I can tell you that out of all the lawsuits that Wild Virginia has been part of in relation to both of these pipelines, you know, we always reach out and we find members who have spelled out their specific interest. And um, so that's, that's a benefit. The other thing is you make sure if you're an intervener that you get copied on everything that goes into FERC and everything that FERC uh, puts out. So you don't have to go searching for things you're supposed to be copied in every case. And then, as I say, the, there is a responsibility, which means you have to return that favor whenever you put something into the docket whenever you submit something officially, then you just have to copy it to a, a list of other folks who are on that same, in that same category. That's not a huge deal. But again, if you wanna be an intervener, we can help you do it. Um, just remember again, the deadline for these comments is next Monday, the 22nd. Um, if you wanna make comments through their website, there's something called the e-comment option. Uh, there's a link there, and, and there are other places you can get a hold of that. But it's fairly simple. You know, your name, your, your contact information, and your opinions. And that's, it's as simple as that, really. Um, so anybody can do it. And anybody who cares about any of the issues from the very most local to the largest scale should do it. Again, it's important. Um, it matters that hundreds and thousands of people have been involved in this, and we got to keep that going. Now, if you want to go the, the intervention route, there's a site that is for e-filing um, so that you can do your intervention there, you can make comments there, and you can con con continue as the process goes forward to submit more information there. Um, and again, we have many resources, more than we can give you, more than I can rattle off here. Uh, one of our great resources is uh, Jessica Sims from Appalachian Voices. And she's gonna tell you now a little bit about uh, how you can get some more help. So Jessica. Thanks, Dave. Um, 
just want to say thanks for the great information that we've heard this evening, such detailed and thorough things that can help comprise the comments that you submit during this uh, certificate amendment period. Um, this is one of the ways you can help in the fight against MVP, and it's very time sensitive since uh, the 22nd is that deadline. I just want to go into a little bit more detail about what Grace has been sharing in the chat. Um, Power, Appalachian Voices, and Virginia Pipeline Resistors have created a how-to guide with step-by-step -step instructions of how to use, how to navigate the FERC website, how to use the e-file option, how to use an e-comment, and then how to subscribe to the docket. Because after you submit your comment, you may want to keep track of what's going on on CP21-57. And so there's tools in that bit.ly guide that give you all of that information. And to flag to, if you do want to submit a personal comment, but it's of a lar larger length or has a file that goes with it, then you can e-file that. Um, so two ways to get your personalized comment in there too. Also want to share that many organizations will have petition sign-ons that are uh, being shared now, um, including Appalachian Voices and others, but that's one way to participate in the comment period. But those unique personalized comments directly into the docket our best. Um, Power is here to help. They've got uh, an email there for you so you can get additional assistance. And they're also offering a how-to uh, event on Sunday, March 21st at 3 p.m. So this is something where you can come with your pre-drafted comment and get help with those next steps of actually submitting it or navigating the website. It is a, a dense website. It is uh, recently redone, but it is still quite confusing and, and quite complicated. And so it's helpful to have that guide up. Um, and please know that you can reach out to any of the organizations represented here this evening or reach power directly at help at power.org. FERC does offer a frequently asked questions um, section and they do have staff that you can call um, if you have sort of technical questions about the site. Um, but again, hope you uh, are able to draft your comment between now and Sunday and, and join the event on Sunday, should you have any more questions about how to submit it. Okay, um, thanks, Jess. And yeah, I absolutely encourage you, at, especially if you're trying to navigate this stuff for the first time, having people help kind of walk you through it. Uh, unfortunately, it used to be we could get people in the room and, and sit there at the computer and help do that, but uh, it is, it is not impossible. It's a little scary, but you can do it if if you want to uh, do any of these options. I'm gonna turn it over now to Grace Tuttle, who I think has been sharing probably all kinds of stuff with you in the chat. And she's been keeping track of the questions you're asking. So we're gonna spend a little time trying to get to, to some of those questions. All right. Thanks, Dave. Um, and thanks for all the wonderful questions, everybody. Um, I know it's a lot of materials. And like I said before, we'll send you the slides, all the links, all the guides that everyone's mentioned. So you'll have all that at your fingertips. Um, so it looks like the first few questions are probably going to be for Autumn. Um, Autumn, do you know if there would be any borings occurring in Karst? That's one of the, um, one of cr the criteria that Mountain Valley Pipeline was looking at. Um, they are trying to avoid borings in karst, but again, they haven't done the thorough geotechnical analysis that they need to do at all of the crossing locations. So they say if they encounter karst during the borings, then they will put into place their karst mitigation plan. In my opinion, that's not good enough. Um, so they need to do a very thorough geotechnical analysis um, to make sure that they are avoiding all karst areas um, and that they need to know if they're going to be encountering karst because, you know, a surprise, look, there's, car there's a big cave here is not good when you're doing borings. Um, so that's definitely something that you want to put in your comments. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just quickly add to that, that I, in, in the past when they had asked to bore under some specific places, including the uh, the Roanoke River, um, you know, they made assumptions like that, and they looked at generalized maps, and then they bored a hole in one side of the stream, but they didn't really look at the kind of detail. So they're they're playing a lot of guesswork here. 
Um, and could either Dave or Autumn just give us a quick rundown of what karst topography is? You want to do it, Autumn? Sure. Uh, the short answer is it's it's basically caves, but it's when you have um, limestone or you know a rock that's like soluble that you know when water gets through there it erodes it away and creates these cavities underground. Uh, so it's it's basically um, Swiss cheese geology, <laughs> what we sometimes call it. Lots and of lots of voids in the in the geology. Yeah. And it can be very, it can change drastically from, from here to 10 feet away from here. So that's why we say you can't predict what's going to happen when you start boring through an area and you don't really know what's there. One of the keys too is that water, if pollution gets into that groundwater in karst right here, it can travel for many miles. It may show up in your well or your spring uh, three to five or eight miles from here. And that's why it's so dangerous. Thank you. Um, and can you tell us uh, what bentonite clay is and if it is detrimental to streams or people? Yeah, it's, it's a, they use it as a lubricant for their drill bits. Um, it's, I mean, it's basically clay, um, but it's, it's very fine. Um, sediment and you know it's it's detrimental in that it, it clogs fish gills it smothers habitat um, it you know it reacts the same as sediment um, and it's not it's not good to have in the water and and people may or not, may not know but clay unlike some dirt that gets in the stream does not settle out easily it can stay in that water column for a long, long time. Um, so it can be a real problem. And we have a lot of it in some of these areas. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the uh, where MVP said they assessed 150 feet um, about the drinking water sources. Was there a location where that originated from or a document? Yeah, that was in the environmental report. And I actually copied and pasted that and sent that long in the, in the private chat. Um, and are any borings planned in waters with endangered species? The Little Stony um, has the candy darter. Um, the Gully River has the candy darter. Um, Oh, those, are, those are the ones that come to mind. Oh, the Roanoke log perch. I don't know if that one's pros, pros to be bored, though. Well, just the thing is, just about any boring that is going to happen in the upper Roanoke subbasin uh, is going to be a p potential impact on the log perch because it's spread throughout the, the South Fork and the North Fork and the, and the main body. So uh, any, there are going to be borings in that, in that watershed area. Uh, one of the things, I mean, just sorting out which are going to be bored, which are already done, which are they going to, going to still dig through. I'm still putting together my spreadsheet so I know where they all are. And that gets to the whole question of, you know, why the rush? <laughs> we haven't even really had the time to sort through all that yet. Switching gears a little bit here, uh, what is the rationale for privileged information, um, like not revealing the affected landowners or cultural resources, um, assuming on the fork dockets? Uh, you know, I'll take a shot at that. I mean, there, there are different kinds of uh, privileged information, some of which we, we will never know why it got that designation. Uh, but as you say, I mean, I, I, I'm certain that it does in some cases make sense if it includes, you know, certain kinds of personal information about individuals. Uh, another reason that it will sometimes be, be marked privilege is if it gives you very specific information about endangered or threatened species. So that is, is valid. But there are other reasons like the company may say, you know, this is this is industry um, information that, or you know, um, company 
important company information or important trade information. So it could, it could be a, a variety of things that make it privileged. And the bad part is we don't, we don't have a way to say hardly anything about that. Um, and next question, can we list the specific damages to that fragile organisms have experienced? I'm assuming that means in, our, in someone's comment, I'm not quite sure. Um, I mean, I, you know, can we, can we show that Roanoke log perch have been, you know, killed in large numbers? No, but what we can say is that the very vulnerable to sediment in streams that they need clear cold uh, streams without uh, with clear bottoms and uh, you know uh, gravel and cobble and things like that and we know that habitat has been destroyed in some areas and it's been really degraded in other areas so uh, what we know is that they've been probably run out of certain areas where they should be able to survive. It's just like if you cause my environment here in, in my house to be degraded and I have to leave, uh, I've got to find somewhere else to go. Uh, so that in itself is important damage. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's those kinds of things that we, we may never be able to prove all the connections until they're gone. <laughs> And we can't wait for that. That's, that's one of the important points is we're supposed to guard against it, not document the damages later on. Uh, we certainly do know of places that have been inundated for, you know, over and over with mud or have been invaded by slips and slides. And so again, that, that's serious damage and we don't want to wait until we see dead organisms or until we find streams that they can no longer live in forever. That's a great point, thank you. Um, and is there a list of all streams being crossed? Um, shared a spreadsheet, but if anybody, maybe Russell wants to speak to that or a little more detail on that. Thanks, Grace. Um, yeah, all of the technical information um, related to this request is going to be there in FERC library. The spreadsheet that's there is something we created to try to condense that down and make it a little bit easier for folks to find. Um, you can you can identify <clears throat> streams that you're concerned about by mile post because they do in a lot of cases use number designations for these streams. So if you know kind of where you are along the route. You can find them that way, but then the the, the plans um, for the crossings and all of the other attached documents will be in e-library. And if folks want more help navigating that, as Jess mentioned, we are doing a follow-up piece to this because that FERC's website, e-library and resources can be very hard, especially for people who are new to it. So we have another opportunity for anybody that needs additional help to kind of walk through that. And that'll be more workshop format, a little bit more back and forth um, with me. Um, and I also wanted to uh, address very quickly, um, while I have the microphone, there was a question um, from Bert in, in the chat about whether the scoping change um, that was announced today uh, changes anything about this deadline. I want to, everybody should treat the March 22nd deadline as the deadline at this point. We have calls into FERC um, to try to get some clarification there. But for now, with the resources that these wonderful presenters have given you tonight, please treat the 22nd as the deadline. And if we have time to comment on other specifics around this project, like these individual crossings and other items, then we'll use that extra time to, to help people get their comments in there. And I just want to make a point on that is that everything people get in the record now can be carried to that next step. I mean, you can be assured that folks are going to be really pouring on people with, you know, kind of the technical knowledge and the chance 
to be detailed. Uh, things you get in the record now, we may be able to carry forward and, and expand upon them uh, in the next step. Thank you for that and for those updates. Um, another question, um, can you give us a brief um, what to expect for the state level strategy for what's next? Well, again, the state level strategy has to do with a whole separate process. Um, it, there's way more than I can get into right now. What we know is that at least the state of Virginia is already looking at some application materials and request materials. That's specifically dealing with the Corps of Engineers authority, which is a whole nother set of stream crossings where they still want to dig or blast through the stream versus going under it. So right now, that's what the state's authority is gonna be aimed at. Thank you. Um, and why is it so important for FERC to hear from the public and not just lawyers, engineers, or professionals? Anybody else wanna jump in on that one? I mean, I would say that you know, locals, you know your watersheds, you know your water bodies, you know your streams. I can look at a map and I can look at their, um, you know, reports, but I don't know the details of each individual stream. And that's where the local voices really are important, talking about flooding impacts, places where, you know, the stream is already eroded, um, changes that have already occurred from Mountain Valley Pipeline, um, that's that kind of local knowledge can't be, you know, learned by a lawyer or a scientist. That kind of local knowledge is really, really important. And it's definitely knowledge that FERC uh, and MPP haven't tried together. Uh, frankly, they'd rather some of that stuff uh, not be known, uh, so they don't go looking for it. Uh, that's that's why it's good for for you all to keep throwing it in there. And I would give a couple of um, examples too from the communities down here. There's a local resident here in Giles County. The pipeline does not cross his property, but it crosses nearby. After they started work there, um, the the spring one spring fed area on his farm drained out, um, and he lost a water resource for his cattle and ultimately decided to not do um, livestock anymore. Other folks have reported that they, they had to increase dramatically the, the amount of times that they were switching out their water filters on their personal well pumps and, and springs and whatnot. So those are the kinds of things that only somebody from within the community with that kind of experience can deliver. And that um, intervener document that we've prepared, which is a template for folks to use to intervene, it looks like something prepared by an attorney because we had some help from, from some really wonderful attorneys to do that, but you do not have to be an attorney or an expert on any of that to submit that that way. By intervening, you're basically saying that you should have standing on this matter because you have these key details that Autumn and David have described as well. All right, thanks everyone. We're coming up on the hour. I'm really sorry um, if we didn't get to your question, feel free to contact us. Um, I've captured all the questions, so we'll try to answer you somehow and send out everything. Um, if you could go to the next slide. Oops. Um, all right, and a, a last uh, shameless plug. Um, if you learn something tonight or feel galvanized to make a comment, um, please consider supporting the work of one of these four um, organizations that put this on tonight. Um, for Wild Virginia, you can become a member and get perks, discounts, um, or you can make a uh, one-time donation. Lots of businesses that participate in Wild Virginia's membership program. Um, for power, you can donate to us on our website, or you can donate to the MVP protest run, um, which benefits power in the Monacan Indian Nation. Um, group of four people are going to be running the entire MVP mainline route over 400 miles that they'll be traversing down the route in April and May. Um, really appreciate any donations toward that project. 
um, and they will be hopefully in some way linking up with a walk, walking the Southgate route, which we'll send out. Um, so that's some great stuff. At Voices, um, become a member. There's perks there. You get members only events. Um, you can make a one-time or recurring donation. And while uh, West Virginia Rivers, you can join West Virginia Rivers. Um, you can choose a campaign to support, or you can get some candy darter merch, um, lots of cool stuff. And your donations help us do this work, um, push for accountable government and protect the places we love. So thank you so much for coming tonight, um, for all of your wonderful engagement, your questions. You'll receive a follow-up email with all of the contact info for us, um, all the slides, all the links, all the guides mentioned tonight. So don't worry about digesting it all. Um, and we hope that you will use your voice and submit a comment or intervene uh, before March 22nd or on that day before five. So thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great seminar, great webinar. Thank you. I will ditto that. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> woot, woot.